Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me for our open session seven. And as those of you who join me regularly know, we do a couple of different types of shows on CWJATU. Primarily, we work our way through the biblical books and letters, doing what we call day texts, where we meet during the week, usually Monday through Friday and most Saturdays, between 6.30 and 7.30 during the week, and around the same time on Saturday. So if you subscribe and you hit the notifications, then you'll be notified when we change shows or schedule shows or go live. It's the best way to stay current. I get a lot of emails or, or messages saying, you know, when are, when are you going to do this show or that show? And that's the best way to know um, is to just uh, make sure you're being notified. So when we do an open session, really, we're doing a less defined show than like our day texts, which are based around the biblical books and letters or the CW jot talks where we have like a subject and we try to stay, you know, within that subject. Now, today... And in most open sessions, I, I start off with a subject. And like on our last open session, open session six, it pretty much dominated the whole show, you know, pharmacia. So probably it will be something similar today. And so in, in this, at times when we just basically stick to one topic, we're still going to ask questions or be pretty much open to discussion of anything related to that topic. So it still fits within the parameters of open session. It's just that, you know, rather than just go live and see who wants to talk about anything, which, which maybe at times is a good idea. Um, you know, I set these up with just a basic intro show, but, but this one's a little bit different. This one's more involved, and I'm willing to go up to two hours today, depending on people's needs, questions, because it's a subject that if you're in any way involved with um, the Watchtower Society or related to or know people who are, then the issue of blood is going to be more important to you likely than um, just any casual person when you mention uses of blood, whether or not that would be an interesting topic. But when it comes to people who are involved with Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower Society, or who are related to those who may be, it's a whole different deal because you realize it's a very serious issue. It's something that the Watchtower Society and, and people who are a part of it genuinely believe. And this is very important for us, uh, those of us who are not um, really a part of the Watchtower Society or who do not support its policy on blood. It's very important for us to, to understand and to remember, if we've forgotten, that most of those who are uh, involved with the Watchtower Society and who support its position on blood believe 100% that it's supported by the Bible. They genuinely believe that. And, and in fact, I would say most, if not all of us listening, who were at one time Jehovah's Witnesses or uh, part of the Watchtower's Jehovah's Witnesses probably agreed with them. Right? We, we, we saw texts that said things about blood and what to do or not to do with blood. And we listened to what the society said, a group that we recognized as, in our view, taking the lead on things like the divine name, neutrality, showing a good example in many respects and things like racism. No one's perfect. And of course, the society has many things that are not anywhere near perfect. But I'm trying to stay focused on the blood issue and its relationship to the Watchtower and those who agree with their view, as well as discuss specific biblical texts that you may either bring up or that I know about and questions. I want to hear any experiences, but let's try to present them in ways that are reasonable or factually based. So I'm going to be looking at things you say, and if they seem credible, I may share them or read them, and then we'll talk further about them. Otherwise, let me just share a couple brief things for us to start. So I'm going to go to split screen mode, and we're going to read just a couple verses from the book of Acts, okay, from the third edition of my JW Defended book, which will make it convenient for us to do that. So this is a text from Mark. We'll get to that later. But here... 
on page 587 of my Jehovah's Witnesses Defended 3rd Edition. You can still get a copy of this in digital and hardback form, but you can also get this section for free on my topical index at the Elihu site. So there are a lot of sections from uh, the book that are there if you would like to check it out. You could go into the topical index under B, B, L, you'll see several links to blood, and I'll put links in the description below from articles or things I've written uh, about this subject. So let's start here. I'm not going to read really a lot from my book. I'm just reading this page because it has the biblical verses or the ones that pertain to the issue of blood that uh, relates to what the Christians prohibited as we're going to read here. Because the society's view is definitely in their mind, as I said, and in their text, based on biblical texts. So the question is, is it correctly based on those texts? Is it based on the text that they cite sufficiently to warrant the kind of prohibition they require and have at different times required for those who are part of their group? Well, let's take a look at the primary text from the New Testament that pertains to the prohibition involving the use of blood before we get into the different issues involving various Old Testament texts and various uh, medical uses of blood. Let's just start with the, the text from Acts, known as the Apostolic Decree, because as I showed you briefly here in this account from Mark, if you notice, and we read this before in one of our other shows, in Mark 7:19. Jesus, and before that, of course, he talks about different things, how there's nothing from outside a man that passes into him that can defile him, but the things which issue out of a man are what defile him. And then this omitted text is not really a significant thing, just a, a manner of speaking that's in this, in or not in this text. And then his disciples came to him, asked him different things, and he said, are you also without perception? Do you not realize nothing from outside passes into a man can defile him since it passes not into his heart, but into his intestines, and then passes out into the sewer. And then Mark, in recording what Jesus said here, added, Thus he declared all foods clean. Okay, so here we have Jesus' words and Mark's explanation of them in recording this account. Now, let's read from the book of Acts just a couple verses. We're saying a little intro here so that we can then refer back to the texts and then not have to read them as we get going. Let's read this last section here. Acts 15, verse 13, and then 19 through 21. And then I'm going to just jump to the specific verses. They're all right here. That's why I'm reading it out of this page from my book. So I don't have to jump, you know, from text to text in the other one. We did it well with the Daniel show. But in some readings, I think it's good to have them grouped like this. So I'm going to read Acts 15, several verses, and then one verse from Acts 21. So it says, After they quit speaking, James answered, saying, Hence my decision is not to trouble those from the nations who are turning to God. Right? Okay, so non-Jews who are starting to pay attention to what was going on with Jesus and the Hebrew Scripture writings and now the Christians forming and, and speaking about all these things. I don't want to trouble those from the nations who are turning to God, but write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from fornication, pornea. Okay, this is not normal heterosexual sex. This is like exaggerated, excessive pornography-like sex. There's other types of sex that are also wrong, but it's important to point that out so that in the context of what is being prohibited, you don't get the wrong understanding. Let's move on. All right, so they, they don't want to burden the people of the nations who are turning to God, but there's some things they want them to stay away from. We'll, we'll talk about abstain later as it comes up, but basically they want them to stay away from things polluted by idols, fornication, pornea, and from what is strangled and from blood. For, he's explaining now, from ancient times Moses has had in city after city those who preach him. In other words, the law of Moses has been read all over the place because he is read aloud in the synagogues on every Sabbath. 
Then the apostles and older men together. So after James finishes speaking, the apostles and older men together with the whole congregation of Christians. By their hand, they wrote, For the Holy Spirit and we ourselves have favored adding no further burden to you, except these necessary things, to keep abstaining from things sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, pornea. If you carefully keep yourselves from these things, you will prosper. Good health to you. Now, chapter 21, verse 25. As for the believers among the nations, we have sent out, we just read it, rendering our decision that they should keep themselves, guard against, beware, from what is sacrificed to idols as well as from blood and what is strangled and from fornication. Okay, so you'll notice that in a couple of these references to what they should avoid, abstain from, or beware of, that it only refers to the object, blood, or something strangled. It doesn't really refer to the action or activity that is prohibited as it involves these things. So the question then is, well, what is, what is it that's being prohibited? So, of course, the clue is in the context because they referenced the law of Moses, which prohibited the eating or drinking of blood or of flesh with its blood. And it further specified that the blood was holy because it had the soul in it. We'll talk about all those things. My point is that the context is specifically referring to what was read aloud in the synagogues every Sabbath from the law of Moses so that it would be an issue for the Gentiles, the people of the nations, who are now turning to God to deal with all the Jews and with the ideas and beliefs about Moses that they've all heard about. So what do they do? Contradict their whole law and history in ways that are going to be difficult to do and at the same time explain the value of the prohibitions in the first place? <laughs> so on the one hand, it's not difficult to show the dangers involved in eating things that have blood or things that aren't properly bled doesn't mean you can't do it, but there are definitely things that are negative when it comes to getting involved with things that aren't properly bled as far as things strangled, fornication, pornea, we know about that, but let's stay specific to blood or things strangled, which is, involves similar things, or similar animals from which blood is taken or not taken properly, and, of, and what is sacrificed to idols. So, we have idol worship, we have uses of blood, and we have pornea as things from the law read every Sabbath that are interfering with the Gentiles turning to God and the Jewish Christians bringing the message of the Christ. They've all been hearing about Moses and not eating blood. They all know the Jews do not uh, eat foods offered to idols or uh, get involved in pornea or eat food that is not properly bled. So, rather than have to deal with that, they're simply prohibiting the things that wouldn't be beneficial for them anyway. And that even though everyone has to choose, these aren't the kinds of things that in, not, in being prohibited from doing, you're missing out on anything, like I said. They're actually protecting everybody and allowing the message to spread. That was the main thing. That's what they were concerned about. So in this way, they, warn, they protect themselves against idol worship. But we know that even Paul in Corinthians writes that it's more a question of the people you're with and the conscience that allows you or doesn't allow you to eat something, whether it's been sacrificed to an idol or not, but not to that idol. See, if you're a strong, mature person, according to what Paul writes, you can do things in ways that your conscience is not affected the same way others are affected. And so he writes that what's more important is that we don't stumble other people, even if we're not bothered by something. So in this context, several things were specifically singled out as important enough to the apostles, older men, James, and the other Christians to tell everyone to stay away from. 
that's not a very big surprise. I mean, I mean, if, if you had as much freedom as we just read in Mark, where all foods are declared clean and where Jesus essentially freed us from the law, having to observe it, think of what was going through their mind. Well, what would, what would be necessary? What would be important? How can we still please God in Christ, not be followers of the law, but not violate something that we know is right? So the law, while not a requirement, still tells us Jah's will, right? It tells us what he feels about things. We're not held accountable to it in the same way because Jesus came and freed us from it. Now we're held accountable to the law of the Christ, treating others the way we want to be treated, the golden rule. And that's very important. But here, together with that understanding I just just provided in terms of the Christian message, freedom from the law, treating others the way we want to be treated, they still specify that they want them to stay away from blood, what is strangled, fornication, and what is sacrificed to idols. So we're going to talk about that more in a minute. But let's talk about what is the society's position and view on this text and what has it been historically. Okay, so before I get into an article that I wrote, let's just go through a brief timeline here and show uh, where we've come. Now, in my third edition, I provide a timeline on pages, starting on page 571, that shows uh, in 1930, that's the first reference to blood transfusions in the Watchtower, listed along with medicines, transplanting of monkey glands, massage, diet, surgery, and similar procedures and remedies as things which have befallen us and which humans have used to cure different ailments. It's not presented in a negative light. It's presented as a means to help to try and help remedy the things that have befallen imperfect humans. That was in 1930. You can get all these references in the footnotes, and this is online for free in my Elihu online. I'm sorry, my online topical index at Elihu Books. All right, so from 1930, that was the first time that I found a reference to blood transfusions in the society's literature and in basically a positive light, um, certainly neutral and not negative. And then in 1934, you get a, a direct positive reference to blood transfusions involving the use of blood for transfusions specifically. And it says, here's what it says down here in the note. It says, it's been discovered that if used within a few hours after death, the blood of suicides or those who die of heart disease or skull fractures can be used for trans transfusion purposes to save the lives of the living. This is now done regularly in the Moscow hospital. So that's how it's presented. And then in 1936, this is the first time the society applied the biblical prohibition against eating and drinking blood to any other means. Okay, so from 1930 to 1936 at least, you've got positive or neutral to positive references to the use of blood for transfusion purposes, even saving lives. But then in 1936, we get this reference to any other means in addition to eating and drinking. 1940, second positive reference to blood transfusion again in the context of saving a person's life. And here's what it says down here in the note below. You can read that on your own. I'm not going to read every single quote, but all of these are here for you to consider to see exactly in what light they were presented. But this is my summary and timeline right here. Then in 1943, three years later, the second time the divine prohibition as to eating and partaking of blood is extended to other means. So within three years, now we've got two references, or I should say within um, seven years. We've got any other means here, but then we go to this positive reference here. So we go positive reference, potentially including a negative reference, positive reference, and then another negative reference to other means. Then one year later, 1944, you get the first explicit inclusion of a blood transfusion in the prohibitions against eating blood given in Genesis and Leviticus. Okay, then one year later, 1945. The 1944 position that we just referenced is linked, which is linked with the prohibitions in Genesis and Leviticus, is reaffirmed. 
but there's no it's linked with it but it's not explicitly prohibiting blood transfusions yet then in 1948 to 1950 the society firmly links blood transfusions with the biblical prohibition against eating blood but members of the society could still decide whether to have a transfusion without fear of being excommunicated and the references are given to you if you would like to look them up on your own below okay then in 1950 to 51 here's how it refers to to taking a blood transfusion disobedience of god's command that could cost one eternal life so they're getting a lot more serious and but yet it was still at this time uh, something that individual members had to decide but they're they're coming out in pretty strong terms here okay 1951 to 53 that's where we were now in 1954 for the first time the society singles out a blood fraction in connection with the bible's prohibition against eating blood the use of a blood protein gamma globulin for inoculations in the fight against polyamylitis is said to be in the same category as blood transfusions so poliomyelitis i believe that's what it is pronounced sorry it's not i don't regularly read these uh this this medical term but i believe it's poliomyelitis so they're linking even before really um creating a prohibition as far as a standard for excommunication they're now getting into the fractions of blood specifically gamma globulin now 1956 blood fractions are again said to come under the scriptural ban this time with the blood protein albumin being mentioned specifically by name then in 1958 the society changed its previous position by no longer considering blood fractions taken from whole blood like gamma globulin as prohibited so now they're they're kind of in a state where they're going back and forth they they sort of developed this position they went back and forth in terms of the the benefits or the positive light of transfusions started viewing it much more negative and then got into the fractions and now they're they're changing what they considered to be the scriptural ban applying to fractions in 1958 then 1959 the society teaches that the removal of one's blood storing it and later putting it into the same person is a violation of the scriptural principles that governing govern the handling of blood so now you cannot take your own blood and store it and then later put it back that's been banned or essentially shown to be a violation of the scriptural rule it's uh, not really at the point where you'd be excommunicated yet but you notice the language it's really strong the society also taught that removal and storage of a person's own blood for a, even for a brief period of time would be a violation of the scriptures the only exception would be if hemorrhaging should occur at the time of the operation and by some means the blood is immediately channeled back into the body this would be allowable so they make an exception there they don't provide a scriptural basis for it they just allow it now 1961 this is the first explicit indication a person would be a person associated with the watchtower society would be disfellowshipped if he or she refuses to accept that it's scripturally wrong to receive a transfusion or to donate your own blood here's their reasoning let's read just this brief paragraph with my underlining added god's law definitely says that the soul of man is in his blood it references leviticus 17 11. hence the receiver of the blood transfusion is feeding upon the blood no the receiver of the blood transfusion is feeding upon a god-given soul as contained in the blood vehicle of a fellow man or of fellow men this is a violation of god's command to christians the seriousness of which should not be minimized by any passing over of it lightly 
as being an optional matter for the conscience of any individual to decide upon. Okay, so here we are. And now things have changed, of course, since this point, but I'm taking us to the point of the clear, the clearest uh, example where they um, established the position that you would, you would, be disfellowshipped if you didn't follow their view that transfusing blood or, or giving your blood for transfusion is essentially violating the law of God by feeding on the soul in the blood. The soul would be like the metaphysical property or the life, which is still it's not something physical, right? The soul the soul can mean many different things. As we know in the Bible, man became a soul when God blew into his nostrils the breath of life after forming him from the ground. Now we have the soul or life in the blood. How is a person receiving a transfusion feeding on the soul in that blood? And what scriptural position is provided to show that the soul in transfused blood not eat, eaten as a food, digested, broken down, but remaining as blood to, to serve as blood in another person's body or your own if you stored it? What scriptural basis is given that shows that the soul is fed upon during that? How would it be fed upon? Since the, bi the body does not actually use blood itself as a nutrient. So there's nothing in blood. If you were starving and someone gave you a blood transfusion, you would not continue living if, you, if that's all you got. Because your body would not be feeding on the blood. And more important for this reference we just gave is the time when they established you'd be disfellowshipped for transfusion or giving blood for transfusion. More important, the body does not continue living because of the soul in the blood, right? So how could a body receiving a blood transfusion feed on a soul if it keeps dying? The only way a blood transfusion helps a person keep living if it's then used as blood to carry nutrients, remove toxins, and provide the thing the person has lost that's necessary for the body to operate. The body's not eating the blood and it's not eating the soul in the blood. We know that because the person who's only given blood will die. So how could it be feeding upon anything that's giving it a nutritional benefit either bodily or soul-wise? Soul There's nothing to show that. But they say here that the person receiving the blood isn't just feeding on the blood. I mean, that is also not true because the body doesn't consume blood that's transfused into it. It continues to serve as blood. Now, if you eat blood through the mouth, then it's broken down in the digestion. It still doesn't provide any nutritional value, but it would go through the process that anything you consumed would do. The body doesn't feed on blood when you have it as a transfusion and there's nothing that shows what they say here happens ever and evidence that shows it doesn't happen because the people who receive only blood die. That is, a receiver of blood feeds on the other person's soul in the blood that they receive. How is that demonstrated or documented ever by the society? I'd like to know. I'd like to know if anyone on uh, the live stream or in the chat has an, an answer for how it is shown that the body feeds on blood, either as blood being transfused to serve as blood or the soul in the blood. What evidence do you have that there's a feeding going on during a transfusion of either one, the soul of the blood, <laughs> since one's in the other, right? Even according to the society. So I'll take that that no one really has an answer because otherwise you'd be ready to go. It wouldn't be that hard for you to provide something that's so easily to give people that have an easy question to ask based on what's stated here as the reason for their position. 
The receiver of the blood transfusion is feeding upon a God-given soul. How? Where? How are they showing that? I mean, they're, they're basically stating a metaphysical um, claim here, right? They're claiming that the thing we can't see in blood, but that's present according to the Bible, the soul, is being fed upon. Now, if they want to claim that the blood or any of its parts are the soul, or the physical parts of the sum are the soul, we'll get more into that in a minute. Fine, that's why I asked the question. Just tell me, how is blood or the soul in it fed upon by the person receiving it? Okay, so George Lopez says you have a great explanation, but if we accept blood transfusion, that's not abstaining from blood. Well, but George, I understand, and, and, and many of us, I think, are, we're in a position where we saw that reasoning from the society. But notice it also said to stay away from things strangled, right? George, would you agree it says to stay away from things strangled also? We, we read... We read the section from Acts. We'll get to your question in a minute, Ryan. So, George, I do. I want to stay with you, though, for a minute. We got plenty of time as long as it takes for us to go over this. It's important. And I want to make sure people get a chance to comment. So, George is basically saying, okay, you're making a good point that transfusing blood is not the same as eating blood basically is what George is saying. But then he says, but you're still not abstaining from blood. That's George's position. Okay. So, and then George agrees with me that the text says to abstain from things strangled. Now, remember what I said earlier about how there was no verb there? That, um, so for example, things strangled. It refers to animals that have been improperly killed and not properly bled as a result, right? Right? So you avoid them because really you can't purify them to the extent necessary to eat them. Is that true? Will we all agree? On, will we all agree? Uh, and if not, tell me. But George, especially you, I want to know. Would you agree that the abstaining from things strangled means that we should abstain from eating the flesh of the thing strangled because of the blood being improperly drained from it or not drained from it in time or sufficiently because of the manner in which it was killed. Isn't that what the prohibition is about? Okay. So we're, we're talking about doing something specific with things strangled. We're not talking about taking the dead animal, removing its fur and using that for clothes or a blanket. We're not talking about taking that strangled animal and using its bones or its teeth for tools. We're talking about eating that animal's improperly drained meat. We're talking about eating the flesh with its blood because of the, the, the strangling. So it's the same with blood. We're talking about something specific that they knew about blood or doing with blood that was wrong. And remember what Acts 15 and 21, Acts 15 really, but the whole context we read to 21 in part, they talked about the law of Moses, how the law of Moses was read every Sabbath. And for that reason, the people of the nations now turning to God were having a problem because they've heard all this stuff from Moses and about Moses. And now here come the Jewish Christians who believe in Moses and Jesus has the fulfillment of the law of Moses. So there, they were prepared for not eating, and this whole mindset of the Jews not eating um, blood or things strangled. But yet, they were still freed from the law because of Christ, and, as we'll talk about in a minute in response to Ryan, Jesus made all foods clean, according to Mark. Okay, let's set that aside for just a moment, though. But po my point is that this is what they were dealing with, right? They were dealing with all these Greeks and Romans who offered all these foods to idols. It was a big deal. It was a big part of, until Jesus came, it was a big part of the Jewish worship, right? Offering foods to Jah, 
in sacrifice for atonement for their sins. So this is a, a very, we have to put ourselves back in the context and the culture in which these groups were operating and teaching and living. And so it was a regular occurrence for many of the non-Jewish Christians turning to God to eat meat that had been prepared and offered to these different gods. So then the question naturally arose, well, okay, we have all these temples and all these gods and all this food offered to them. What are we supposed to do? Not eat it or eat it and offend Jah or the Christ. So they came up with these regulations in the same way for the excessive sexual practices. Remember, even Paul said the Corinthians were in excess of the nation's sexual practices. Uh, so, or he wrote to one of the early uh, the Greek Christian groups and stated that. So there were levels of activity involved with these things, whether it was eating blood, meat, sacrifice to idols, or fornication, idol worship. This is a big part of Greco-Roman life and in, in, in some ways also Jewish life, so, but in, in a different respect. Nevertheless, the law of Moses had been read in those places, and so they were aware of these things. They all knew who did what and to what God. So it was an issue for them. They, they had a, a regular problem in these areas. And the apostles' way of dealing with that was to tell them, stay away from blood, stay away from things strangled, stay away from things sacrificed to idol, and stay away from excessive pornography or sexual things, pornography. But the context of that prohibition is the reading of the Mosaic law that involves the eating of blood and of flesh with its blood because of not being bled properly or because the animal was strangled. That's the whole context of the law. There's not an instance in the Hebrew scriptures where blood is talked about as being used in another person's body for the same purpose it's used in your body. Granted, that may not have been something they were aware of, although the Egyptians were very advanced. Nevertheless, it still doesn't specify, even if the ancient Egyptians or even others before them, like the Sumerians, used blood in certain medical practices, that would have been an easy thing for them to reference then. Uh, blood for purposes of health or benefit. But the biblical prohibition is about respect for Jah because of the life in the blood. The food, the blood has no nutritional value its purpose is otherwise associated with the life that Jah gives to us. And so it's out of respect for Jah that we that the Jews were told not to do that. And the fact that blood is really not a good thing for you to eat. You can get very sick and die from, from eating blood. So there are, there are reasons why it's just not some odd prohibition that's given for no reason. But it's also not a prohibition given in the context of the Mosaic law that has anything other to do than with eating and maybe drinking, just like things strangled, right? So if, if we're going to say that abstaining from blood is so absolute, that is without a context and it's applicable in all ways, the, the society is going to have a lot more problems, right? Because they don't abstain from blood. They, they don't prohibit people from allowing blood to be taken from their body and tested in a laboratory. Yet, they'll quote texts from the Bible that say you're supposed to empty out the blood of slain animals on the ground. Well, they're not, they're not following that principle when it comes to removing blood from your body for medical testing. Why is it okay to remove your, your blood or anyone's blood store it in a laboratory, run it through a series of tests. You think that's showing respect for Jaws uh, blood? Why is that okay? And using it as blood in another person's body is not okay. Or even in your own body, right? I mean, they're not really consistent on that either in their writings. And so unlike the apost apostolic decree, so you have the decree given that covers several things that were an ongoing problem, for the Jews, Jewish Christians, Greeks, and Romans. But they didn't keep, you know, going backwards on it. You have more in Paul, 
where he explains circumstantially how you could go about dealing with these things, right? So he makes it more practical for people. But it's not like we get a bunch of different versions, you know, of the apostolic decree. Yet the society, in just the period we read uh, covering from 1930 to 1961, changed its position numerous times. And in their view, they had been, poor, been appointed since 1919 after um, the Gentile times ended in 1914, according to their chronology and, and the different things about Jesus coming in the kingdom. Won't get into that today. But my point is, there's a big difference between the consistency in the apostolic decree that can be shown to be reasonable contextually and that Paul explains how you can live with practically and the many different positions of the society that go way beyond what we can show contextually only clearly involved eating or drinking blood. That's all they knew about. Or that's all that's in the law of Moses and that they were writing about. So they were not to eat or drink blood, nor to eat animals that had not been properly bled. Nevertheless, I know there are, there are even then, right? People like uh, Ryan mentioned, and I quote at the beginning, Jesus said, all foods are clean. But that doesn't mean there still isn't a good reason to avoid doing something for the sake of your brother or for another. So just because we're not supposed to eat or drink blood, that doesn't mean we should then enforce our view on others as far as other uses of blood. If so, then I want someone to point out to me where in abstain from blood you get anything from the context and the law of Moses that allows you to go beyond eating and drinking. Because we interpret these things in context. We don't just interpret them and read back into them a 20 or 20th or 21st century uh, medical view. They were dealing with eating and sacrifice. They were not dealing with medical issues here. This is not Timothy going to Paul and saying, what should I do about my upset stomach? These are people who are having a hard time turning to God because they're among the nations and they don't understand these different things about blood and law of Moses and what we're telling them now about the Christ, right? Even Ryan's question in the chat. So we have prohibition about um, certain things to eat and then yet Jesus frees us from these things. Well, so this is why. This, they, there was a lack of clarity in one respect, and that is similar to how people today often view things from the Old Testament, like the Sabbath. When we read in the Old Testament, Jah's will, you know, how he feels about things, it's just hard for us not to want to do it or think that's what we should do, right? And if you do, that's okay. The problem is when you start to think for other people, and when Jah, even though he gave laws in the past that bound his people, if his son came and freed us from that law and now is going to hold that person accountable for what they do or don't do, you're not to be involved in that person's decisions. Yet here, look, look at the highlighted section of what we've been reading. This last part. This is a violation talking about feeding upon the soul and the blood, which is not demonstrated or documented in any way as blood or as a soul. But notice this again, the seriousness of which should not be minimized by any passing of it over lightly as being an optional matter for the conscience of any individual to decide. They're saying no to that. What, what does Paul say? You are not to do that. You are not to stand in the way of another individual's conscience. In fact, that is directly in violation of what is taught, that we should follow what our conscience says because otherwise we're definitely wrong, right? If we go against what we know our conscience to be saying, we know we're condemning ourselves. But if we don't, if our conscience says it's okay, you see, that's the whole point of what Paul writes about in Corinthians and in Romans, where we're, we are not to be judging others. We are not masters of other people's conscience. 
Certainly not when it comes to things clearly um, uh, involving practices that are not described in the Bible, like transfusions. Using blood to stay as blood, not be broken down by eating, but to take uh, blood in its blood form and keep it in its blood form, and like an organ transplant, put it in another person. I'm not saying necessarily, or by the way, that that's what you should do. I'm saying you should be able to decide whether to do that because the Bible doesn't do it for you. It doesn't decide that for you. Yet the society is deciding it for you. They are. It says you're feeding on the soul in the blood. How is that demonstrated or documented or shown? It's not. They don't show it at all. And as I explained, eating blood through the digestion process goes through a breakdown process that even Jesus said makes all foods clean. But then we look at the text in Acts so that we say, okay, well, the apostles knew that. They must have known what Jesus said, but they still saw this as something necessary. So, and that's the answer, Ryan. What Jesus said is true. But at the time Jesus said that, they weren't dealing with the issues involving the Greeks and the Romans that made it something necessary for them to keep in mind. We don't have this problem today. We wouldn't need to have them tell us this today. Because no people in our area, for example, like in California, it's that you don't go to a marketplace and buy meat sacrificed to idols. It's just not a part of the commercial process. Not that it's in any way demonstrable or known. You know, what they do behind the scenes or wherever. The fact is, you know, you can go to markets today. There's even sometimes blood in the meats. You, have, you know, you can drain it or what have you. My point is, it's not sacrificed to idols. It's not from a thing strangled. And we're not buying blood or eating blood in ways that are obviously prohibited by these texts, even though there may be some blood uh, remaining in it, just like there would have been in the meat they ate. There's no way they could have drained every single piece of blood or particulate matter of blood, but it was done enough or sufficiently to show respect for cha and not eat too much of something you're not supposed to eat. And that's not good for you anyway. But they make claims they cannot defend about non-eating uses of blood. <clears throat> Let me jump from this. Okay, we talked a little bit about the history. We read Acts. We talked about various texts. Now, let me share with you this article here that I wrote in 2010. Actually, I wrote this article before I did the revised section of chapter 9 that we've been reading from here in my third edition. This was kind of the basis for that. Um, so this article here on the Watching the Ministry blog, if you haven't read it, you should. I revised it a little bit this morning. I'll put a, a revision on the bottom here, but I just made a few basic changes. Let's go through a little bit of this text, okay? <clears throat> because it has quotes from the society that are going to be consistent with what we just read and go beyond the 1961 position, okay? I'm not going to read it all, but let's just take a look. This is right here. This is the 1958 quote that I referenced in the timeline I gave, but let's take a look at it a little bit more. We didn't really read this. Here's what they said in 1958. This is three years before the prohibition position leading to disfellowship. So the question is, um, well, here's they're, they're talking about whether they should equate blood with its component parts. And so, the society writes back and says, no, it does not seem necessary that we put the two in the same category, although we have done so in times past. Each time the prohibition of blood is mentioned in the scriptures, it is in connection with taking it as food. Like I just said, just like the context, the reading of the law of Moses. And so it is as a nutrient we are concerned with its being forbidden. Now, so they say that here, they say that they, well, in the past they have equated um, the two, that is um, the use of, of blood for medical purposes or the use of, not the fraction or equal blood, but the use of blood for medical purposes and the use of blood as food. In the past, it says they put them in the same category and they did. They went through a change at different points before this time. 
if you look at my timeline. But now they're saying, no, we don't need to equate the medical transfusion with the eating of blood. And that's why my timeline here, 1958, society changes its position, no longer considering fractions taken from whole blood as prohibited by the Bible's teachings against eating blood. So their concern is it as a nutrient. Whereas in the 1961 quote we read before several times, it's with feeding on the soul in the blood. And I'm going to argue that you can't demonstrate either one is done by a transfusion. And that's the problem. But by eating blood, you can at least show that a person is attempting to consume or feed on it. It doesn't actually give them any nutritional benefit. And so even their remark here, it is a nutrient. I'm not sure that would even qualify for eating blood. So in other words, this basis here, and the basis for feeding upon the soul in the blood, those wouldn't even apply to eating blood, like eating, eating blood, because it doesn't work that way. It doesn't serve as a nutrient. And there's no, no basis to argue that the soul in the blood is consumed in the digestion process. So it doesn't, what they're saying, it just shows a lack of understanding about consuming blood or what it's, why it's consumed or what it does and why it's prohibited in the biblical text because it's sacred to jaw not because it's a nutrient there's all kinds of things that are nutrients that we get to eat there's something else about the blood it's sacred in a way jaw doesn't want us disrespecting by openly eating in an obvious way and it's not good for us as a food so this is very odd to me when i see this kind of basis for prohibiting the use of blood in transfusion or even eating directly because it doesn't provide nutritional benefit. Nutrients are carried by the blood. You'd have to add the nutrients after the blood or eat nutrients with the blood, like meat with the blood. Blood alone wouldn't do it. Okay, so then here's the 1961 position that we kind of been referring back to, feeding upon a God-given soul. That to me is like the, the most impossible thing to prove right how would they be able to prove that you're feeding on the soul especially when you don't even get life when you take blood in as either transfusion only only blood or eating only blood neither one of them would show a feeding on a soul or the blood in a way that would allow you to have a nutrient or live okay so now let me jump down before we get to some more comments let's go through this a couple more things this will, set, this will set up the rest of our discussion. So, let me just show you the part I want to, I want to mention here. So, I've been talking about transfused blood being different from eating blood. And I write here, it's similar with organ transplants, which is what a blood transfusion is since the organs are not eaten by the body once they have been transplanted. Neither do the transplanted organs serve as food or nourishment. Organs, including blood, have specific purposes and functions created and designed by God. Blood is one, transfusion blood is one way to allow blood to continue to function as it was intended. It's not being used as a food or in a way that was unintended in the transfusion process. Now, notice how the society put this in um, an article from 1977. You can see it here, and I'm going to read it for you, and it's quoted if you want to look it up on your own. It says, Why did Octavio Correa refuse the blood transfusion? Answer, basically, because of the Bible's prohibition as to the use of blood for nourishment or to prolong life. But blood as a food or transfused as blood does not do that. And that's not what the Bible says is the reason why. It says because the life's in the blood and it's disrespectful to eat it as a food because you can't get the life as you could from a food. And you don't. It's proven by the fact that when you eat it, if it's only the thing you eat and you're starving, you die. But here it says it's because the Bible's prohibition as to use of blood for nourishment or to prolong life. That's not what eating blood does. So how could that be the Bible's prohibition? <laughs> how could the Bible's prohibition be against the use of blood for nourishment 
or to prolong life when eating blood doesn't do that. Even transfusing blood without any nutrients added to the blood wouldn't do it. But certainly in the context of Acts 15 and Acts 21 and in the Old Testament text, we're talking about eating blood. But if the prohibition against doing that, eating the blood, was because of the nourishment, that, then that's scientifically disprovable. So the society is actually using a basis for prohibiting the use of blood according to the Bible that is not scientifically true. Namely, blood provides as blood nourishment, either as a food or as blood. It provides nourishment by carrying nourishment. And so let's read the rest of this quote. The Great Encyclopedia, this is the society quoting them. Okay, this is their source. The Great Encyclopedia del Delta La Russe, Portuguese says, underlining his mind, blood is living tissue that runs in the circulatory system and whose main functions are one, carry needed nutritive, nutritive substances. Carry them. It's not them. It's carrying them. A car carries passengers. The passengers are not the car. To carry needed nutritive substances. Yet here, it's citing this to prove that the Bible's prohibition is to use blood for nourishment. Here, it defines the uses as carrying nourishment and oxygen to all tissues, collecting, taking residues useless or dangerous to the cellular activity to excretory organs. Sodomy is also bad for that organ too. <laughs> we'll get on, we'll, we've talked about that. Thus, blood nourishes and cl cleans the body. Okay, this is the society here. Blood nourishes and cleans the body. Jehovah God, who knows more about blood than anyone else, prohibited the eating of blood. Eating blood does not do this. And eating blood does not do this. Why would they say that this source supports their view that eating blood nourishes the body when it says blood carries nourishment throughout the body? Eating blood doesn't do this. And blood is not this. Blood is not a nutrient. Blood carries nutrients. And eating blood does not provide nourishment or clean the body. A transfusion of blood will help clean the body, removing it of toxins. But the Bible doesn't say anything about cleaning the body as the reason for avoiding blood. That's like the exact opposite. It, it pollutes the body in ways that either contaminate it because blood is not a good thing to consume or because of the dangers involved with animals who haven't been properly bled. If you eat them and job use blood is sacred, not because it has nourishment, it isn't. <laughs> so this is very strange that they would claim, number one, this sorts supports their position that blood provides, blood is nourishment when it really just says blood carries nourishment. And then, so they say blood nourishes the body after citing a source that says it carries nourishment to the body and then use that to support their view that it's eating blood. What's prohibited is eating blood and this is all involved in eating blood. Yet eating blood does not nourish the body either by providing blood that the body can use to nourish the body with food or as a nutrient, neither one. If you eat blood, you get neither one. You don't get blood that continues to serve as blood, like in a transfusion, and you don't get any nourishment, not without adding other food or, nourish, or uh, nutrients. And when you eat blood, how does that clean the body? 
it cleans the body according to the source they cited when it's transfused as blood, not when it's eaten as blood. Look at how odd this is. I mean, they're either really, really bad when it comes to citing and applying sources or they're just doing it in a way that's not honest. I hate to say that. I know it's terrible. It's hard to believe. And remember how I started the show. I believe most people who are part of the Watchtower Society do believe the Bible teaches us to avoid blood in the sense of all medical uses. Yet even the society has contradicted its own position several times. And in its explanation for its defense of its position makes no sense. It makes no sense in terms of what eating blood provides, right? Nourishment or cleaning the body, neither one. And whether or not blood actually nourishes the body when transfused, it doesn't. Not as blood. It'll carry nourishment just like the source they quote says. (laughs) But then they totally reword the language so that it's the blood that is the subject, not what it's carrying. Now let's take a look at another more recent uh, text from 2004. We'll read a few things here and then we'll talk more on the question side, but I want to share some things with this article here. Okay. Very important information to share. Try to remember. It's easy to, when you're talking to any Watchtower person, you know, you, you want to help them. I know. And you get excited like I do. And we all try to tell them about things. And But remember, they believe the Bible teaches us. They, they're trying to do what they think is right. That's not an excuse for doing something wrong. But some things are more complicated. But now, So there's a difference. I would, I would encourage you to keep in mind a difference between people who are just trying to do what's right. They've learned what they've learned. It's hard to master everything. All this medical science, biblical terms, abstain from blood. What do I do? Okay, I'll avoid it all. Follow the society. That's kind of what happens, right? And so it's, you might think that this is so clear, and it is, but there's a lot more to it than even just blood. Even if they see the position on blood that we're talking about and the problems with it, with the society, you, you, you should be concerned about that person's faith. And if you're just not a Christian at all and you just, want to, you know, you hate the watchtower, you hate the blood policy. Well, do what you got to do. I'm trying to talk to people who want to help those who are just misled, trying to serve John Jesus, but they have this group they belong to. And the leadership is in a position where they've, they've put forth so many different positions and have entered into the realm of medical science in ways that the Bible can't support and made statements about what happens when you eat blood that you can't support scientifically. They have boxed themselves into a corner where at this point, because of the extent of the prohibitions and the damage it's done to various people and families, it's going to be very hard in my view for them to get out of this unscathed. That is, they're, they're never going to be able to shake the stain of forcing people to take this many bad positions. These aren't just positions that are in every way kind of so complex. It's like, okay, I can see where they got that wrong. No, this is stuff that doesn't make sense. It does not make sense when you just read through it basically and look at what they say, that you're feeding on the soul and the blood. How? Explain how because it's helping you preserve your life? Well, how is that feeding? See what I'm saying? It's an organ transplant. It's giving you something you lost that you need that your body's not consuming as a food, period. Why feeding? Why is it feeding on the soul? That's their term. How is blood, when eaten, providing a nutrient to the body? How is it providing a nutrient when it's transfused as blood? other than carrying nutrients that aren't a part of blood to the body. So in every respect, their weakest argument is eating blood, right? It, their weakest argument, well, although I would also say transfusion, probably more so, but 
I actually think their weakest position because of the different ways they go about referring to the soul and blood as something that the body's feeding on when you receive it in a transfusion, I, I think they actually double up there in their wrong. So I think they're wrong clearly in the medical sense in which blood is used as blood and not as a food. There's a difference. It's obvious. It's not clearly stated as part of the prohibit, prohibition involving eating and drinking that was known through the law of Moses. But I, I, I don't see, they're twice wrong on the eating part. You, there's nothing that shows you're eating the soul, feeding on it. No more than you would be feeding on an organ that's transplanted to serve as that organ in your body. And there's nothing that shows that eating blood gives you nutrients or would prolong your life if you were starving or the transfused blood. But see, see my point? My point is we often look at the weakness in their position in connecting transfusions with the prohibition against eating blood. While I see that eating blood is prohibited, what's happening is they're using the wrong basis for prohibiting the eating of blood. They're claiming that eating blood provides a nutritional benefit. How? Where? It doesn't. There's nothing nutritional about red cells, white cells, platelets, or plasma. They're, they're wrong in almost every way when it comes to these teachings because the basis for why they believe the prohibition is also in correct. And they're not consistent with it either. Let's take a look at some of these texts. So they cite Genesis, Leviticus, and Acts as ruling out transfusions of whole blood, packed red blood cells, plasma, and white blood cells, and platelet. Not one text in those three biblical books says or implies anything about using blood as blood for medical purposes or where blood continues to serve as blood in the body versus being broken down after consumed as a food. Then the, 19, the 2001 textbook, they cited as saying blood is made up of several components, plasma, red and white cells, and platelets. Yet the textbook they cite in stating that blood is made up of those four things, notice they conclude in line with the medical facts. They, they quoted this text right here. That's why I'm breaking it down the way from up here. I numbered it. See the numbers in the quoted text? They correspond. Here's what they say. In line with medical facts, that blood, this is the medical fact right here. Blood has four components. That's the medical fact. And then they conclude, in line with medical facts, witnesses refuse transfusions of whole blood or of any of its primary components. But that's the the medical text in stating that the four components of blood that in stating that and in their different purposes and functions elsewhere shows they're not blood. The society is committing a basic fallacy here, a categorical fallacy. It's called division. They're applying what may be true of the whole in this case, blood. The Bible never refers to parts of blood. It only refers to blood. But the society commits the fallacy of division by applying what is said of blood to its four component parts. The fallacy of division is when you, state, when you take something that's true of a whole and apply it to its individual parts. So it would be like me saying to someone, go get me that car and you just bring me the four tires. The tires are not the car. They're a part of the car. Like red cells are part of blood. But red cells alone are not blood. Just like the tires are not the car. It's the fallacy of division they've been committing for a long time. I point this out elsewhere in my writings and it's hard to see every time they do it. Because so many people's lives are involved and so much is at stake. But that's why I wanted to talk about it. Because they're committing the fallacy of division. 
by applying these prohibition texts to these particles or components of blood. And they haven't even been consistent as they stated themselves in 1958 or since then on the uses of these components. And as I said, they do not prohibit taking blood from a person's body, running it through a bunch of tests, storing it in a laboratory, and then later on discarding it. So why wouldn't that be a violation of the text that says you have to spill it out on the ground? Why is it okay to keep it out of your body that long and to test? Where does the Bible say that's okay? Well, I'll tell, tell you where it says it's okay because it doesn't prohibit it. And so it's okay in the sense that you get to decide it. Because doing those things, taking blood from your body and testing it, is not included in the prohibition in Acts concerning abstaining from blood. It's specific to eating blood or animals not properly bled, things strangled, right? You can still use a thing strangled for weapons, for clothes. It's talking about a specific use defined in the law of Moses that involves eating and drinking blood or improperly bled animals. And so the society's problems have only become worse as they've tried to decide more than what the apostolic decree tells us. And that can only be to abstain from blood in the sense in which it was read aloud every Sunday in the law of Moses, or every Sabbath, I should say. <laughs> May not have been Sunday. And that is with respect to eating and drinking. There were no medical prohibitions known of or used at that time, or reference at least, as it involved the use of blood as blood. Like we see today, and there are all sorts of ways in which blood is removed from our body that the society does not prohibit, that involve medical uses, but they don't have the biblical basis for their position, either for defining the four components of blood the same way they do as blood, which is a fallacy of division. They don't have any basis for concluding scientifically or biblically that the body feeds on the soul in transfused or eaten blood. And they don't have any basis scientifically or biblically that shows that eating blood provides nutritional benefit or that that's the reason why the Bible prohibits it. Like they say, the fact is that Jah prohibited the eating of blood or animals improperly bled because the blood was sacred to him in ways he didn't want us to disrespect or to be contaminated from because of eating something that was not good for us because it had no tr nutritional value and, and in fact um, it could be uh, damaging if, if, if eaten too much as science has shown. So I just don't find the society's position convincing even in its most basic sense of eating blood and the reasons why they claim it's prohibited. I believe we should do our best according to the text to avoid blood, eating blood, drinking blood in a way that would show disrespect for Jah according to the laws he gave Moses. Even though we're not technically bound by them, it was a good thing for the first century Christians to do in dealing with all these Greco-Roman non-Christians, non-Jews who had heard Moses read all over the place. And it's also good for us to keep in mind today so that we don't offend Jah or other people. But I would encourage you, like Paul, not to get involved in other people's business or to run around and be the, the blood police or the, the eating improperly blood meat police. Try not to offend your brother. Be that kind of police. <laughs> don't offend your brother or sister if you can help it. If you are in a situation where you have foods or blood or something there that people are eating, they're a different culture, non-Christians, whatever, do your best to avoid if it's going to stumble anyone. There are reasons why the apostolic creed was given in the way it was given, even though Jesus freed us from all foods, according to Mark chapter 7. Nevertheless, we follow these early Christians as an example for us, and what they say has wisdom. There's no benefit from eating blood, or things sacrificed to idols, or things strangled, or pornography. So aren't we already sort of on board with all that stuff? <laughs> the problem is when we make we take it too far and we try to say, well, how much, you know, do we have to bleed the meat or 
Now do medical transfusions qualify as eating blood? That's really the big issue. And the society chose to take on that issue. So it's up to them whether or not they're going to change their policy at this point and make it easier for people to exist with them and to work as Christians, but not have to deal with this problem that people have over whether the Bible speaks at all to medical uses of blood and to what extent the society's position about nutritive value and soul feeding is actually scientifically or biblically based. That's the real problem today. And I, I just cannot really see a way for them to get out of it without doing just that, saying we're not going to take this position anymore. It's up to you. They should have done this a long time ago. They actually had this view at one point. But like with any other group, people change. Groups are not the same over time. Governments are not the same over time. The Christian congregation from the first century changed over time. The Jews went through changes over time. Why wouldn't we expect the society to go through the changes we just reviewed that we can show they've went through over time, that they admit they went through over time, but that they're still going through or that they've reached a point where there's not much else else they can do. And so those who have come to know Jehovah and Jesus through them are sort of stuck unless they are able to separate their faith from following what the Watchtower teaches, which is a problem. It's not a problem to work with different groups or people. It is a problem when those people or groups require you to do things not taught in the Bible or explicitly taught or (laughs) that your, your teaching is contradicted by. When people do these kinds of things, they have changed. This is no longer the society or the group that's just teaching the divine name if it ever really was just that. And my point is, when we came to the society, those of us who did, we saw those things that in the biblical text were obvious. We recognized and we we appreciated that they were, were, were sharing with others. But now we have all this. And I don't think it's necessary. There's not any biblical text to support their position on the prohibition of blood as blood in a medical situation or on prohibiting blood fractions as if they were blood or of the same category as blood in a prohibited sense. And there's no explanation really for their allowance of blood to be removed from the body, stored, tested, and then discarded versus simply being poured on the ground, which they uh, used as their position in the past. They've been inconsistent the whole time is my point. There really hasn't been a consistent position like we see in the apostolic decree. In fact, they've messed it up. They've taken what was clear and not eating blood, not eating animals that were strangled and improperly bled. And now we don't know what it says. Or we're so caught up in this argument over their views that have changed multiple times many times over us over almost a century we're almost at 2020 we started at 1930 so there's a situation where now we really have to we have to be careful going forward we have to deal with people who are misled we don't want them to die needlessly right or be confused about what the bible teaches but we know their faith is in some way tied to the society improperly like ours was at some point and maybe some of you watching. And the fact is, apart from the society, you're not going to be able to function unless you decide you can function apart from them. And they're not going to let you do that. Not and still work with them. But you can function apart from them and then you will not have to bear the burden of their interpretations. This is on them. Let them stand before the master. Right? I'm asking you, to do to the society what they refuse to do to you and me. Let them be judged on their own and let them stand before Jesus, just like you and me.